Well, hey, good morning, Edge Church. Welcome to the Sunday after Easter. I don't know how most of you feel, but I can tell you that church staff all over the country is feeling what a lot of us know as a holy hangover. It was a lot of fun, and now we're super tired. In all seriousness, though, it was so good to gather with you guys, and we've been gathering a lot more in in a large group gathering uh, recently at One Way Ministries, and I hope that it's been as awesome for you as it has been for us. It has been so good to see all of our community come together and celebrate Jesus together. If you didn't have the chance to be with us last week and you didn't see the Easter message, I highly encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and watch it and see why, uh, as as Pastor Steve said, that Easter is both a, a celebration of the resurrection and it's also an invitation to those who do not yet know Jesus. Because we are convinced that Easter is a message for all people. It's always been God's desire to be in relationship with all people, and he proved it. He didn't just talk about it. He proved it by sending Jesus, his one and only son, to live a perfect life and die on the cross and ultimately be raised from the dead. He demonstrated that that the love of God could not even be held down by death. And today we are continuing in the series that we've been in for a while now called Active Discipleship. Now, I just want to acknowledge that those two words together might sound a little bit redundant to you. As discipleship, it, it already is supposed to be active, right? It, it's, it's what you do. Uh, but over time, um, you, you probably recognize that words tend to lose their meaning because uh, of repetition and incorrect usage, and eventually people sort of forget what things actually mean. And we see that in all sorts of ways. Um, we, we might call ourselves a lot of things, and, and that doesn't necessarily make those things true. Now, my dad was a PhD psychologist, a whole lot of education. He was a very smart man. And he drove a particular point home with me very early on when I was young. He pointed out um, that when he was in, 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 a, in a time to hire and he would get a lot of resumes that came across his desk, he would look very closely at their academic credentials. And oftentimes he would see people put two specific things down. One would be that they had a PhD and the second was that they had something called an ABD. Now, to some of my dad's colleagues, this was really impressive because they thought that the applicants had not just a PhD, but some other mysterious doctorate on top of it. My dad explained to me that ABD stood for all but dissertation. Okay, so then he said that that the applicants put this on their resumes so that they would get a job and look like they had two incredible doctorates. But the reality was they didn't have two degrees. As a matter of fact, they had not even yet finished the first one. It's really no different um, with the idea of discipleship, which means that we're following Jesus. That's what it means. We literally follow in the steps of the teacher, practicing this life as Christians and learning what Jesus told us to do and and then living that out and inviting others on this journey with us. But we aren't actually living out discipleship if we aren't doing those things. We can say that we're doing those things, but if we aren't actually doing the things, then we aren't doing it. We are disciples with an ABD. It might look impressive, but the reality is it's, there's not much to it. And it certainly isn't impressive to God. So in this series, it's our desire to talk about and then invite you into what real discipleship consists of. And in that, you will always be active participants. A couple of weeks ago, we started talking about relationships and the role of relationships in discipleship. We talked about how if our connections with people are not rooted in love, then we've missed out on the whole point of this life with God and with people. Today, we're going to focus specifically on our relationship with God. Why is it that we're doing that? Why why do we need to talk about our relationship with God first? Well, simply because it's the most important relationship that you will ever have. Ultimately, you will answer to no one in your life, no matter the role they currently play, no matter the connection that you currently have, you'll never answer to anyone to the degree that ultimately you'll be held accountable by God. That is why your relationship with God is of first importance. Now, the truth is there are a lot of influences and influencers in our lives and in our cultures. But none of those things or situations or people lay claim to your actual DNA. But God can. 
You came from someone and one day you will go back to him. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we get this picture of God's design and his loving creation of people. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is why it's essential for us to make sure that we are, first of all, if no other relationships are right, that we are in right relationship with God. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about what it looks like to continue in that relationship with him. First, the bad news. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the problem, and we can't do anything about it. We can't be good enough. We literally can't do anything but receive from God. The very next verse, verse 24, it says that all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrated last week. That's what Easter is all about. And if you've not received the grace of God, maybe you you heard last week, you heard the details about how God loves us and he's for us and he died on the cross for us, but you have not given your life to Jesus. And you're like, so what do I do? How do I get on this path with this incredibly gracious Lord? Acts 2.38 gives what I believe is, is the most complete, beautiful description of what any person must do for all time to receive the grace of Christ in the form of the cross. And it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's very straightforward. I want to be incredibly forthright with you. You don't have any part of God, and you won't have any part of God, no matter what you think or feel, apart from receiving the saving grace of Jesus. This is not a popular message, but it is the truth, and I I have to share that with you. Everything, everything begins with your relationship with God. You don't get to define your own terms with him. You don't get to enter heaven based on how good you think you are. Your eternal destination is solely based on what you do with the person who is Jesus Christ. We don't share that with you to scare you. I'm not trying to to scare you into praying a prayer so I can say, awesome, there's someone who who prayed a prayer because they were scared. No, I know that this is a better way to live. I am inviting you into a better way of living where you know that you have a secure relationship with God and a secure destination in him. So that's the starting point. Easter is the beginning, but, but shouldn't there be more? Can you imagine going through the trouble of planning a wedding, buying the perfect dress? If you've you've ever gotten married, you know what this is like. Uh, The the bride looks for the perfect dress and and, and the the groom looks for the perfect tux to rent and you pick flowers and and place settings and locations and you plan the reception and you go through premarital counseling and then you finally experience the day of the wedding and, and hopefully you don't lock your knees and pass out. And then can you imagine if you were pronounced husband and wife and then you didn't live together? That sounds ridiculous, right? Like to get married and then just be like, okay, well, that was fun. I'll see you later, I guess. That sounds ridiculous. But how many people do you know personally who prayed a prayer once and and they went to church and and they might have been baptized and then for one reason or another, they've walked away from their relationship with God. Let me be very clear. I am not at all talking about people that have kind of spotty church attendance. I'm not even talking about people who've walked away from attending church. I am talking about disconnecting from or even willfully walking away from Jesus himself. And if you've been around church for a while, you know that it happens. Life gets hard and it pulls us away. Or life gets really good and it pulls us away. And you slowly just start to disconnect from Jesus. You don't sense that he is, he is who you thought he was or life is good enough that you're like, I guess I don't really need him. Or maybe God didn't answer your prayers in the way that you'd prayed. What do we do with all that? 
And, and, and how do we keep that from happening? There's a moment in the gospel account of John where Jesus was saying really hard things to his disciples. And, and some of the disciples walked away and they weren't any longer disciples. They literally turned back. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. It says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. If I'm being really transparent with you, there have been plenty of times in my journey as a follower of Jesus that I have sort of wondered, like, is there, is there something else? This is exhausting. This is hard. This is tiring. There's too much criticism. I'm worn out. And I've wanted to wander. I've wanted to. Maybe these verses ring true for you too. But here's the thing. Where else would I go? Where else would I go? I know that I know that I know deep down in my soul that there is nowhere else for me to go. But becoming a Christian is one thing. It's just the start. Walking it out with Jesus for the rest of our lives is a completely different thing. We all want to be saved from hell. No one ever is going to say, like, I think it's a great idea to, to go to eternal punishment. But it's a whole lot more difficult, if we're being honest, to give Jesus the rightful place of being the Lord of our lives. But where else? Honestly, where else do we have to go? And what does that mean for us? Jesus knew that we'd all get to this point at some, at some part of our journey with him, that we need to be reminded of our connection to him and just how essential to our lives and, and living out lives that are vital, vitally connected to him, just as his original disciples needed that same reminder. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, and it's our main text for today. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever it is that you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." At first glance, when you read this, it might appear that Jesus is threatening the salvation of his followers. It's almost like this, be really good branches, because if you aren't producing enough fruit, you're useless to God, and you see what happens to those that are useless to God. You're going to be thrown into the fire of hell. But to believe that, you have to completely throw out verse 3, which already says to the disciples, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. One commentary I read suggests that that verse itself suggests that they are in a close and saving relationship with Jesus. They are justified before God by the grace of Jesus. These people are saved, so it can't mean that. But how do we reconcile verse 2, which says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. What does it mean to be cut off? That sounds bad, right? That sounds like a terrible, terrible punishment. To be cut off, it sounds very ominous. We have to acknowledge that. But the verb in Greek to cut off or to remove can be translated as takes away or lifts up. The, the verb can be translated takes away or lifts up. One of my favorite preachers is Tony Evans, and his Bible commentary says that, that, God, that this passage actually means that God will seek to make you more fruitful by lifting you up, by encouraging you, and motivating you. For, for example, through his word or through the community of the people of God. 
The commentary also speaks to the burning of branches. It, it means a loss of, of fellowship with God and the closeness and the rewards that come with that. Often, the commentary suggests it, it comes in the form of divine discipline or you get burned and your spiritual life withers. But the truth is God is always in the business of restoration. So even though this passage very strongly, I believe, is not about salvation, it is still about something that's very important for believers in Jesus. And it's this importance of staying connected to Jesus, remaining in him or abiding in him. So for the rest of our time today, we're going to look at practical ways for us to actively abide in Jesus. And then we're going to look also at the corresponding results of it. Here's the first. I encourage you to take time to consider the vastness of God and to be real about your own fragility. Take time to consider, to meditate on the bigness, the vastness of God, and be real about your own fragility. One thing that's continually resounding in my heart from this passage is the simple phrase, apart from me, you can do nothing. I would bet that for a lot of people, uh, probably people who don't really believe in God or have any saving faith in God, that sounds completely ridiculous because they're like, uh, look at me, I do a lot of things. But I, I believe that it's true and I believe that two things, uh, it actually means two things. And the first is that it really means that apart from him, people can't do anything. We can't wake ourselves up. You cannot will your heart to beat one more time. You can't think without God. You can't work without him giving you ability. You can't grow or heal or do literally anything else without the grace of God and the provision of God every single minute of every single day of your life. John chapter 1 verse 3 says this about Jesus. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus made us. Jesus made you. Colossians 1.17, it goes a little further. It says, he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's interesting. So it tells us two things. Jesus created us, and he does maintenance on us. He created us and does maintenance on us. Like, he made us, and he didn't, he didn't like, remove himself and go at a distance from us, but he's holding it all together. He's holding people together. He's holding the world together. He literally holds everything in his hands. It's implied here that without the exertion of the, the creative force of Jesus and without him expressing his power and, and, and shaping our lives, that we could not exist and we would literally fall apart without him if he removed that strength and that power from us. The second meaning, I believe, from the passage is, is, is really just for the believer. And it really means that if you are disconnected from Jesus, if you focus more on your own efforts, uh, your own works, no matter how good and holy that they appear, you will never do anything of eternal significance in God's economy apart from him. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter what you do on the face of this earth while you're here. While you're here, you can come up with a cure for cancer, you can solve homelessness, you can give clean water to everyone on earth. But if you are disconnected from Jesus, no matter how good those things are, all of your works will be thrown out. They don't matter in God's economy, which is eternal. Now, what would happen to us? What would happen to you if you spent more time focusing on Jesus than trying to do good things for him? I can tell you, um, my own personal experience, I am closer to the Lord when I focus more on him and not trying to do good things to impress him. I'm not as burned out and I feel more empowered by the spirit of God to do everything that he has planned for me to do. Just like we're told in Ephesians 2.10, that God has planned good things for us to do, but good things come from the root of being connected to the Lord, and then the fruit comes from being on, connected to his vine. So here's the second way that we abide in Jesus. We are obedient to him. So be obedient to him. Jesus said a lot of things. So what exactly does it mean? Be obedient to what? What exactly? 
Well, we talked about this recently, that when Jesus was asked by by religious leaders what the most important commandment was, his answer basically summed up the Ten Commandments. He said this, love God and love people. It's interesting to note, um, you probably know this, uh, but five of the commandments are about our connection to God and five are about our relationships with people. Anytime you intentionally show love to people, Jesus recognizes that as obedience to him. And when you do that, you are rewarded with with, uh, remaining in God's love. You're going to experience a special closeness with the Lord, a, a special new kind of connection, a new level of intimacy with him when you are obedient to what he has said for you to do. Does this mean that that you aren't loved by God when you are selfish or unkind? Like, is there something that you can do that God's just like, well, I did love him. I did love her. I, I, I really liked them. But then they did this, and now I'm not so sure anymore. Absolutely not. God is not fickle like people. Absolutely not. It does, however, mean that you will have less closeness with him. Now, you know this. If you have kids, uh, you know that there is a closeness and trust that develops between you as as your kids follow instructions. Isn't it amazing how much more you want to do for your kids and how much more you feel connected to your kids when they do something? They, They kind of go along with the flow of what you expect of them. It doesn't mean you love your kids any less when they're disobedient. You might be irritated with them, but you don't love them less. It's not like suddenly they're out of the family, but you do have less connection with them. And that trust, it's built up. It takes some time. And the separation that you feel in in your relationship with your parents or with your kids when there's there's sort of a disturbance in the force of your relationship is exactly the same as with the Lord. When we don't do what he says for us to do, we will feel a disconnect in that relationship. It's simply a natural consequence. But in order to be obedient to Jesus, we have to know what he has to say to us. And the Bible is the primary tool that God has given us in order to abide in the words of Jesus. Now, you can say, I want to follow Jesus, but if you don't know what he said and you don't know his heart and his character, what are you actually following? I would suggest that you're following a version of Jesus that you have created in your image. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see why it's so important that we must have a very high view of the Bible if it's our desire to abide in Jesus? The Bible is the source of the words and the life of Jesus. We have to take it extremely seriously. And and what is the byproduct of your obedience? Two incredible things happen when you are obedient to the Lord. Money can't buy these things. Verse 11 tells us, it says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus is saying that when you're obedient to him, it's not going to feel like this, this heavy burden, like you're wrapped up in chains, like you're a prisoner. He's basically saying joy is like a a serotonin jolt that isn't dependent on circumstances. If that sounds otherworldly, it sounds kind of odd, it's because it is. We don't experience those things here on this earth. That's not the way the world works. The problem is for some of us, let's be honest, it's it's not easy to sit and read the Bible. Like our attention spans are not what they used to be, right? I see that. I see that in me. I see that in my kids. I see that in lots of people. Probably part of that has to do with social media, and it's a lot easier to sit down and relax for a few minutes uh, or a few hours looking at social media or Netflix. You might have a shorter attention span, um, but when you stop and think about it, when you look at the benefits of social media versus the benefits of knowing and, and practicing what God says in the Bible, which do you think actually adds value to your life? 
I can tell you that um, I know that there are times when I need to stop watching news stories and I, I need to stop looking at social media because I actually feel an angst. It's like the opposite of peace. There, there's sort of this like this level that that I reach where. I, my mind gets a little bit saturated with the negativity that's happening in the world, and I sense that I'm feeling angsty. It's not a good thing. I've never once felt that with Scripture. I've never once read the Bible and thought, well, that wasn't a good idea. Every single time I've done it, it has added value. It's added value to my mind, to my body, to my soul. When we read the Bible, we are connecting with the Holy Spirit. We are learning the mind of Christ. And when we practice it, we are connecting ourselves intentionally to the heart of God. Now, here's the second byproduct of, of obedience to, to Jesus. Verse 7 tells us that when we abide in Christ and his words remain in us, something amazing happens. We will have answered prayer. We will have answered prayer. How many of you guys have things that you've been praying about? You've been praying about this particular thing or this person or this health condition or, or a new job or, 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 or there's, there's just someone that you're concerned about, you've been worried about for a long time. But it says that we will have answered prayer. The God of all things listens to our prayers and he answers them. But that's absolutely connected to what we do with the things that he has already told us to do in his word. This isn't some heavy-handed thing like God is re rewarding us for cowering to his will. If, we, if we're just perfect little servants, then he's going to reward us. No, God's commands to us are not heavy burdens, but they're soul restorers. I'll say that again. God's commands to us are not heavy burdens, but they're soul restorers. He knows how he designed us. And when we do the things that he said for us to do, life just tends to be more peaceful. There is never one time in my life as a Christian, I've been a Christian since my senior year in college, never one time in my life as a Christian that I have regretted a moment when I have clearly been obedient to the Lord. As a matter of fact, I have almost always sensed, I, I can almost picture it, this overwhelming sense of, uh, of God's pleasure when, when, I, when I choose to follow his instructions with my life. And it brings a peace and a joy that you can't buy with, with cash. So here's a third way for us to abide in Jesus. Pray like you're, you're really dependent on him. Pray like you're really dependent on him because you actually are. You actually are. The right posture of prayer really is simply acknowledging uh, dependence on God. It's not about telling God how good you are or, or, or how impressive you are. It, it's not saying just the right words. Uh, I, I've heard people say, well, I'm afraid to pray in front of other people because I'm afraid I won't say the right words. Well, here's the good news. God doesn't care about the words. He doesn't care about them at all. He wants your heart. He doesn't want you to try to sound like a super religious person. He doesn't want you to learn to pray like me or pray like Pastor Steve. He doesn't care about those things. He wants to know what's on your heart. He wants to connect with you. He knows all of the things that you're afraid to say to him, and he still loves you and wants to be with you anyway. That's incredible. There's a parable that, that Jesus shared about, really, it expresses two different postures of prayer because there are some right ways to pray and there are wrong ways to pray, but, but it really has to do with the posture of our hearts. Luke 18, verses 10 through 13, Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, so a, a religious leader, and the other a tax collector. Uh, speaking of taxes, those are due very soon. Ugh, scary, right? So the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. You can almost picture the smugness. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's quite a difference in posture between the two, and it's not about words, it's about their hearts. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 6, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, when you hear that, um, 
Do, do you kind of think like me? How many times have you been in a tough spot and you've been abrasive instead of gentle? You know, the word says, like Paul writes, let your gentleness be evident to all. Yeah, when you're hard pressed, are you sometimes abrasive instead of gentle? Are you sometimes angst filled instead of prayerful? Are you sometimes grumbling instead of thankful? Or, or thinking that you're better than you really are because you're comparing yourself to someone that you think is worse than you? And what have you received for those efforts? What, what have you received from your actions? My guess is probably ulcers. You probably have uh, some blood pressure issues and certainly more worry. My experience has shown me that anytime I give myself over to worry, and I've watched this in my friends and family over and over again, it never ends there. Worry always compounds because worry is never satisfied. But earnest and humble prayer, it has completely different benefits. Philippians 4, 7, it tells us the result of prayer. It tells us the result of prayer when we entrust, when we abide in prayer to the Lord. It says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? It means when you don't know where to turn, you have nowhere else to go and you turn to Jesus. He looks at you and he says, I got you. I've got you. It won't make any sense to you in your circumstances. You might not see the way out, but he says, I've got this and I've got you. And while humility is rarely celebrated in our culture, it's one of God's favorite characteristics in people. Luke 18, 14, it says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's pray. Father, you have shown us what it means for us to abide in you. While our salvation is not dependent on anything except what you did for us, the closeness that we experience with you has much to do with our decisions. Help us to make the right choices. Help us to make choices that will resonate from here into eternity. May every other thing that we're doing that, that does not matter in eternity just fall away. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be back with you in just a few minutes.